Welcome to our YouTube channel, where we uncover untold stories and plots. In the 19th century, a scandal involving sex and murder at a Rome convent ensnared practically every major player in the church hierarchy. Nuns using visions of God to persuade novices to have sex, threesomes with priests, the poisoning of a fat German princess, a prominent theologian shacking up with a vicaress, young nuns murdered, fetuses removed from an abbess, and cardinals, the Jesuit superior general, and the Pope all enthralled by a beautiful and charismatic fraudulent saint. It's enough to put the Decameron to shame. Subscribe and embark on this enlightening journey with us. The hard-to-believe story that contains all of these juicy nuggets, the 1858 scandal at the convent of Sant'Ambrogio in Rome. The level of intrigue and the variety of scandal are at some point so bewildering that it's hard to keep things straight. So, perhaps it's best to start with the woman who triggered the whole mess, the twice-widowed, famously corpulent Princess Katerina von Hohenzollern Sigmaringen. Despite health issues, Katerina was determined to join a convent. After one failed attempt, her advisor, Cardinal Rysak, suggested she join the convent at San Ambrogio. However, after a mere 15 months, in 1859 Katerina would be rescued from the convent by her cousin, the Archbishop Hohenlohe Schillingfurst, and rushed to recuperate at his estate, Villa d'Este. What pushed the princess to flee? According to her denunciation to the Holy Tribunal of the Sanctum Officium, the Roman Inquisition, she had discovered the convent to be a cult venerating a false saint, a hotbed of sexual intrigue, and broken confessional seals. And she hysterically claimed there had been an attempt to poison her. Between 1859 and 1860, Judge Vincenzo Leone Salwa conducted a detailed investigation to find out exactly what was going on at the monastery so that Pope Pius IX could decide whether to open a trial. The story he uncovered was far more dramatic than the princess could have imagined, and implicated some of the most powerful cardinals of the day, the Jesuit general, and multiple popes. It was the kind of scandal opponents of the church joked about, libidinous nuns and priests run amok behind the closed doors of the convent. This was not the first scandal for the convent. Its founder, Maria Agnes Firau, had once been the toast of the Catholic world for her visions and healing powers. The former pope, Leo XII, considered her a close spiritual advisor, as did numerous cardinals and the king of Sardinia. She was later found out to have fraudulently claimed to have performed miracles, had an affair with her confessor, had two abortions by the church when she got pregnant by clerical officials, engaged in a threesome with her confessor and another nun, and encouraged her novices to venerate her as a living saint. The Vatican publicly denounced her for her actions and stripped her of her abbess title. However, that same Leo XII issued a brief in 1829 largely exonerating Firau from the 1816 Inquisition verdict. One of the sins the princess charged the convent with was that the nuns were venerating Firau, a false saint. She was right, Salua discovered to his horror, but there was also a rival for the nuns' adoration. Maria Luisa, at just 27 years of age, was the convent's alluring novice mistress and vicaress. It turns out that Maria Luisa, who Katerina accused of the poisoning, was seen as an upstart fraud by the founder Firau. She claimed to have visions from Mary and Jesus, and the nuns at the convent, including the abbess, believed she had miraculous powers. However, as Salua discovered, she was a monster who used her supposed visions to entice novices into her bed, embezzle convent funds, and poison opponents. One nun, who was luckily exiled and not killed by Maria Luisa, told Salua that Maria Luisa claimed the Lord told her in a vision she needed to treat a sickness in the nun's private parts. She claimed that another vision had told her that a liquid that came from the Lord flowed over my whole body, collecting in the lower part of my body, as in a little hollow where it then remained, and that they should share in this liquid. Another nun confessed that Maria Luisa was keen on something she called giving which involved asking me to lie in a certain position, with my legs raised, while she entwined herself with me. She then made movements and a sound such as I cannot express in words, and she instructed me to position myself so that I could receive her bodily fluids into me. Or, continued the nun, she wanted me positioned above her, so that we were body to body and mouth to mouth. 
Maria Luisa told this nun that her bodily fluid was a gift from God to heal the nun's sickness. She also created an initiation rite in which novices had to sleep with Maria Luisa the night before they were made nuns, made to lay face to face and breast to breast. However, in a twist of events that will be unsurprising to modern audiences, when Maria Luisa confessed to these actions, she also disclosed that she had once been a victim, and that Firao herself had once done the whole this liquid in my privates is from God routine to her when she was a novice. Maria Luisa also admitted to trying to poison the princess, who had figured out that Maria Luisa was less than saintly. She gave the princess gruel with ground glass, tartar emetic, and opium in an attempt to kill her. While Katerina would suffer, she passed with stomach lining in her excrement, so Maria Luisa went about killing off her accomplices. One of them survived. Three others, 121, 122, and an elder nun, were not so lucky. The story of San Ambrogio are not merely concerned with tales of lurid sexual escapades. San Ambrogio was also at the center of a significant theological war within the Catholic Church, as influential players in that war were ensnared in its drama. The scandal and its aftermath also highlighted a degree of unfathomable leniency when it comes to grave crimes committed by members of the Church, again, something all too familiar to modern readers. As Salua finished his investigation into the nuns, he turned to the two Jesuit confessors, Giuseppe Lezzaroli and Giuseppe Peters, who Caterina accused of being in league with Maria Luisa and of breaking the confessional seal. The investigation into Lezzaroli revealed that he had continued to venerate Firao in spite of the Inquisition's decision that she was a fraud. However, the investigation into Peters proved far more rewarding and problematic. Maria Luisa had admitted to a full-blown sexual affair with Peters, as well as confirming his role in supporting her manipulation of the rest of the convent via the confessional. But Peters was in fact not his only name, he was actually Joseph Kletjen, one of Rome's more prominent theologians, whose writings influenced everyone from the Jesuit superior general to conservative cardinals to the Pope himself. Kletjen hailed from the wing of the Church most determined to reinforce papal authority through theological dogma in the aftermath of the Napoleonic Wars. The notion of papal infallibility, for instance, originated in this time period. Kletjen and his allies, which included the aforementioned Cardinal Reisot, were opposed within the Curia by none other than Katerina's cousin, the Archbishop Hohenlohe Schillingfurst. Kletjen had also used Maria Luisa's visions, which were believed by the Jesuit superior general, to expose the homosexual relationship of two theological rivals within the order. Now Kletjen and his work were being undercut by his own deeds. In one interrogation, Kletjen defended his sexual relationship with Maria Luisa with the theological argument that sex with her was without lust and therefore was not a sin. Maria Luisa, quite simply, was guilty of embezzlement, sexual abuse, and murder. This was explicitly aided and abetted by her Jesuit confessor Peters, the theologian Kletjen. But their guilt also undermined the authority of the papacy just as it was trying to consolidate it. When it came time for their sentencing, they were each to be imprisoned in a monastery or convent. While Maria Luisa might have faced the death penalty and Kletjen a heavy sentence in most secular societies, Pope Pius IX actually reduced their already lenient sentences. After much debate, Kletjen was imprisoned for three years, which Pius reduced to two, which Kletjen served at a house of retreat on Lake Nemi. One of the cardinals involved had actually wanted no punishment for him. Maria Luisa was sentenced to 20 years, and Pius reduced it to 18. This came after multiple attempts by Pius to suppress or avert a full-blown investigation into the convent. Maintenance of the church's image and preservation of those in power took precedence over justice for murdered nuns and sexually abused novices. The decision by the Jesuit order, even its own historians, to downplay or erase the affair from works about Kletjen or this time period is especially disheartening. This damaging picture, the father of new scholasticism as a criminal and seducer, and the Jesuits and their friends in the Curia as a society of gullible bigots, should on no account be allowed to enter the public imagination. After Pope Pius IX commuted the sentences, it became clear where the Pope's sympathies lay in this trial. The Padre was part of his Jesuit network. 
Kletgen and the Jesuits were reinforcing the Pope's sovereignty, this required caution and leniency. But in any case, it is important not to miss one of the story's greatest ironies, the refreshing devotion of the investigating judges to the Inquisition. While popular history associates it with brutal torture, the Inquisition treated and treats matters of faith with such rigorous skepticism that it feels like watching the work of an atheist.